Well, we finally made it across the courtyard and we've made it to the tabernacle. In Exodus 26, most of the chapter is devoted to how to build this impressive structure. It was a structure that was made with four layers of skins that covered the top of it. We know that the structure was probably about 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. The first layer of the tabernacle would have been beautiful linens woven together with purple, blue, and red. And inside of that would have been woven beautiful cherubim into all of the design. Next would have been 11 curtains of goat hair woven together. The third layer was goat skin dyed red. And then the fourth layer, the word says, was sea cow or some type of sea creature that would have been dried and then extended on the outside, the final layer. So it doesn't look pretty from the outside. It doesn't look impressive. But as you notice in the space behind me, there's plenty of room to store things. And many people believe that when people brought gifts to God, that it would have been stored inside of here. So how impressive is it when something from the outside maybe doesn't look as great, but when we go in inside and we see all that it is, it's beautiful and full of the richness of God. The next part of the structure we want to come to on the exterior is the pillars. Now these pillars were made of acacia wood, covered in gold, and they would have had bronze bases. On the inside, there's four more pillars, and they're made of acacia wood, covered in gold with silver bases. Now on the outside, we have five golden pillars, and some would say those represent the first five books of the Tanakh. On the inside, we have four golden pillars, and some would say those represent the four Gospels, the first four books of the Brit Hadashah. The five bronze bases represent judgment, and the four silver bases represent redemption. And that's the redemption we have received through Yeshua, our Messiah. As we move to the north side of the tabernacle, or the right side, we find the table of showbread. This is the place where they would have brought in the 12 special loaves of bread that they made and they would only bring them on Shabbat, but they also would only eat the old bread on Shabbat, and that was only for the priests. Traditionally, they say the bread still would have been fresh after sitting out for over a week. Though this table was small, it served a very special purpose, and it was made from acacia wood and gold, and the bars and the rings were made from gold and acacia wood as well, but in the instructions of making this table, it says to use acacia wood that was not blemished, we know that people say that wood relates to the human nature and how this table is foretelling of the Messiah that the wood was to be unblemished just as our Yeshua was and that the gold represented God and so it talks about the nature of Yeshua and how he was human and unblemished but also God in nature. I'd like you to turn please to Exodus chapter 25 in your Bible. It's wonderful to see some visitors from Malaysia, way up in the balcony. Great to see you. My good friend Joseph Wong, we met in Japan uh, several years ago when I was speaking there, and almost every year bringing a group here to King of Kings. Bless you. And there are many other good friends and visitors here. We're going to read now from Exodus 25, beginning at verse 23. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame or a handbreadth of a handbreadth of all around you, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs." The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table, and you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. And I just poured some water on my shirt as I opened the bottle. That was very appropriate. I didn't even know that verse was coming up. The Lord works in mysterious ways. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always, always. 
Well, we've passed through the gate at the eastern end of the courts of the tabernacle. We have passed the brazen altar. We have passed the brazen laver. And this evening now, we have the privilege as the priests of God to enter into the tabernacle proper. Within this tent are two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Now, if it's the day of atonement, only the high priest can go into the holy of holies. But regular priests that serve the Lord can come into this first room, the holy place, any day of the year. As the curtain is drawn back and you step into this room, you no longer have to squint your eyes from the sun, that bright sun in the wilderness, in the desert of of the Negev or Sinai. The only light that shines inside this room is the light from a candelabra, a menorah, on the left or on the south side of the room. Now, as you gaze around the room, you see two other golden pieces of furniture. Beside the lampstand on your left, in front of you actually, stands the veil, that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And there you see this piece of furniture, which is the table of incense. Now you turn your gaze to the right, to the north side of the room, and there you cast your eyes upon the table of showbread, or literally in the Hebrew, the table of bread of faces, lechem hapnim. I was reading a commentary by a Jewish scholar who says that this room is quite similar to the dining room in the home of a wealthy person in ancient times. It has a table set with bread, a lampstand for light, and an incense burner, all items that were typically found in dining rooms in the biblical period. When guests arrive, very soon the host brings guests into his dining room to offer them food. And then when the meal has been eaten, the host burns incense as a finale, filling the room with lovely aroma. It would be just like our loving God to design such a hospitable room to welcome his servants, his priests, into his presence. You know, the primary reason that God created you and me is that he could have fellowship with us. I love that last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Just about everything outside and inside the tabernacle, God designed to show how you and I enter into his presence. After we've had our sins paid at the altar of sacrifice, that brazen altar, where Yeshua gave himself voluntarily as a once and for all atoning sacrifice for our sins. And having been made clean at the washing of the laver through the Spirit and the Word, we are now fit to enter into the very dwelling place of God, into his own home. The awesome God of the universe invites us to come into his dining chamber and fellowship with him. I love that verse in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Later this evening, we'll be eating from the table of the Lord. And how appropriate that the roots of this table fellowship that we have in the Lord's Supper is already foreshadowed in the Torah here in Exodus chapter 25. I've jumped ahead of myself a little bit. I'm moving quickly to the spiritual meaning and the application of the table of showbread. But it's also important not to go too quick and not look at the details, the specifications in the design of this table of showbread. You know, every word in the scriptures is God-breathed, and thus it is important. So we're going to take a moment and just look at some of the specs of this piece of furniture. God revealed to Moses that the table should be made from acacia wood, in Hebrew, shittim. And that is, it is to be overlaid with pure gold. The table top is bordered with a crown, a zer, 
which is a hand breadth, breadth high, four and a half inches approximately. And um, according to the commentators Kyle and Delich, there were two such ornamental wreaths, one round the slab of the table, the other round the rim, which was under the slab. At each corner of the table were rings through which rods were placed in order to carry this table on the wilderness journey. This table was not very big. You know, Pastor Kurt filmed this in the wilderness and uh, stood by this table of showbread, and that table looks really small. Let me just say, anything next to Pastor Kurt looks small. When you're 10 feet tall, uh, that's just the way it is. But actually, the table of showbread is about the size of a piano bench. That's all. But what was on the table? Well, according to Exodus 25, there were dishes, pans, pitchers, and bowls for pouring. But the most significant thing found on that table was bread. And the description of this bread is found in Leviticus chapter 24. Why don't you turn there in your Bibles, Leviticus chapter 24, and I'll pour a little more water. Leviticus chapter 24, I used to be comforted by the sound of rustling pages as people turned in their Bibles, and now it's just plain silence. I'm assuming it's an iPad, it's an iPhone, it's an Android, it's something. All right, some of you are still in analog. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 5. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Now, when we look at the amount of ingredients for each of these 12 loaves of bread, they must have been quite large. They were so big that there was no way to have two rows of six loaves each on that table and still have room for the dishes and the pitchers and the pouring instrument. And so you actually see some very interesting pictures of the table of showbread, at least attempts to imagine what it would have looked like. And you can go to Google and look at images and type in the word table of showbread, and you'll find hundreds, maybe thousands of images, and some of them are quite humorous. The one I actually have in my notes right here is a little bench, like a piano bench, six stacks, or six loaves stacked on one side, six on the other, and then the pitchers sitting on top of the bread. That's interesting. Every Sabbath, while the incense is burning on the table, the priest replaced these 12 loaves of bread with another 12 fresh loaves of bread that had been baked earlier on Friday before the Sabbath began. Now, once the new loaves were in place, the priests ate the week-old loaves. I've heard of people buying day-old bread, but week-old? Perhaps, as some scholars say, this bread was actually unleavened bread, and they were a lot flatter and drier, and we've all had Passover, haven't we, eating that cardboard that we call unleavened bread. It's probably more preserved over a week than normal bread, but it tastes just as bad. Now, we've looked, well, you're supposed to, you're supposed to afflict yourself on Yom Kippur, right? And you afflict yourself with the bread, the matzah as well, to remember the suffering of the Jewish people in their wilderness wandering and as they left Egypt. Now, we've looked at the specifications of this table. It's now time to see what to do with what we've learned, how to apply the spiritual significance of this table of showbread. 
Well, I read that the table is made of acacia wood covered in gold. This could be symbolic of the fellowship of the human with the divine. And just as wood, like this acacia wood, grows out of the ground, so Adam, the first man, was created by God from the soil, and then he grows up. But God only fellowships with those he has made holy, for he is holy. And this particular wood speaks of purity or holiness. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament of the Torah and Tanakh, these rabbinical scholars whose mother tongue really was Greek translated this word shitim, which in your Bible probably says acacia wood, they translated it as katharu in Greek, which means clean or pure. And you and I need to be pure and clean if we're going to approach a holy God. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. How did you enter this place of God's presence, this sanctuary where two or three or more have gathered together in his name where he is? How did you enter? Did you go to the laver? Did you look in those bronze mirrors of the women from which that that labor was made? Did you see yourself as you really are? Did you agree with God and say, I have fallen short of your glory. I've fallen short of your standard. I'm not as holy as I should be. Have you confessed your sins today? Did you do that before you entered the presence of God? One of the wonderful things I see in some liturgical type congregations around the world is that they all have prayers of confession in their liturgy. Sometimes we who have a more, what we think is spontaneous form of worship, often forget this vital step that we should take before we come into the tabernacle of God's presence. And by the way, this place is called the pavilion, named after Psalm 27, verse 5, that says, For in the tr- time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. What is the word pavilion in the original Hebrew? It's sukkah, which means tabernacle. Sukkot is the feast of tabernacles. When you come into the tabernacle of God's presence, you should come having your sins washed by the word and by the spirit. As you're honest and transparent before God, and you know that he is faithful and just and will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But you must confess. You must agree with God that you are a sinner. Now, the table of showbread clearly foreshadows the table of communion. And before we come to the table of the Lord, we need to be in a state of purity. Paul warns the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And Paul rebukes those believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and following when he gives instructions concerning taking the Lord's Supper. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And because of their divided and sinful and impure state, Paul will say later in that chapter, in relation to partaking of the Lord's Supper, These words in verse 27 and following, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So you and I need to be like that acacia wood, that wood that speaks of purity, that we might have fellowship with the divine. Our God, who is holy in every way, and like the pure gold of that table that covered the wood, 
So we must recognize that God is the great judge of all the earth. And when we come before him, he already knows our weaknesses and he knows our sins. Why don't we just agree with him and say, you're right, God. You know, that's what the word confess, confession means in the New Testament Greek, homologeo. It means to agree with. Why don't you just agree with God and say, you're right. Instead of trying to justify yourself or hide those sins from him, he already sees the inside and the out. He knows you just as you are. And now let's look at those 12 loaves on the table. In Isaiah chapter 21, verse 10, the Lord speaks of the people of Israel, his people, as those who are threshed like grain. The fact that there are exactly 12 loaves on this table signifies that all of God's people, all 12 tribes of Israel, are before the face of God. I want you to note what it says in verse 30 of our main text in Exodus chapter 25. You may need to go back there to see what I'm about to say. In verse 30 of Exodus 25, And you shall set the showbread, lechem panim, that's the Hebrew, on the table before me always, tamid. In Jewish writings, the ones known as the Mishnah, it says that in order to ensure that there was bread at all times, tamid, before God, Every Sabbath, one priest at the table was to slide the fresh bread onto the table as the other priest slid the weak old table off, uh, bread off the table so that not even for a split second was a loaf of bread missing from that table. That's why this bread is called lechem hapanim, or bread of faces. The bread was always to be before the face of God or before his presence. For often the word panim or faces is a euphemism of presence. Let me just show you that for a moment. Exodus chapter 33, verse 14 and 15. Moses says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, that is God said, My presence, Panai, will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence, Panecha, does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. In Exodus 30, uh, 25, verse 30, we read, And you shall set the showbread, lechem apanim, on the table before me always, tamid. And so there was always bread on that table to remind the priests and remind the born-again believers of God today that God doesn't show up one day and disappear the next. He is not fleeting, but he is always there. He is the God who is always there there. That's why David wrote in Psalm 139, verse 7 to 10, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. That's Sheol, by the way, the place of the dead, not hell as we think of it. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And yes, there were 12 loaves on that table. Clearly, each loaf represented one of the tribes of Israel. Every tribe. A little tribe like Benjamin, a big tribe like Reuben and others. All of them, big or small, strong or weak, had the privilege of being before the face of God always. And I say this to all of us in this room, if you belong to the people of God, whether you think of yourself as small or great, God's presence is always with you. If you are part of God's olive tree, whether grafted in as a Gentile or re-grafted in as a Jew, you are always before the face of God. You're always in his presence. The loaves of bread of God's presence signify something else as well. On that table, God himself is presenting something for us. 
food for our sustenance. David once said in Psalm 23, Thou preparest a table before me. God provides you and me our daily bread. You know, the Babylonians and the Assyrians back in those days used to offer bread to their gods for their gods to eat. (laughs) Reminds me of the pagans of our day who put out milk and cookies for Santa Claus to eat after he comes down the chimney. Most of us do it in jest, so I'm not here to condemn. But these loaves on the table weren't for God to eat. They were for us to eat. And in fact, the priests were commanded to eat those loaves. And the priests were given this bread to eat as a reminder of God's constant provision, his constant sustaining of life. You know, in our modern society, with our McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, we miss the importance that bread had in the time of the Bible. In the Hebrew mind, in ancient times, bread was the principal food of life. In fact, lechem is used in the Bible many times to refer to all kinds of food in general. And and in the Bible, bread is called the staff of life. Bread is like a staff in in the hand of a man, one who needs to lean on it. And in those days, bread was what you leaned on. If you didn't have bread, you would fall, you'd fail, you'd die. Today, we've got all kinds of replacements for bread. And some people can't have bread anymore because they're allergic to it and its ingredients. But the point of this is that God comes to us, the hospitable God, the host, inviting us into his banqueting chamber. The banner over the chamber is love, and he offers us food every day. The blessing that's said over food in this country and among in Jewish homes around the world is, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam amotzi lechem mina aretz. Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. No mention of the steak on the table, the green beans, the horseradish, who brings forth bread from the earth. This bread on this golden table was a constant reminder to the people of God of his provision. Yet how quickly they had been grumbling in the wilderness, fearing that they would not have enough to eat. And when they got something to eat, the manna, They got sick and tired of this bread of heaven. No wonder God had to have a table in this holy place to remind them that God supplies all of our needs. Have you been grumbling lately? Unthankful for what you have and wish that God would give you more. Or wondering if he's even got enough He wants to give you even the bread for your table. Believe the words of Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by the Messiah Yeshua. You know, it's amazing that we get miraculous provision at the times we most need it. And when we have plenty and it overflows from our refrigerators, We don't get those miraculous interventions quite as often. So sometimes it might be a nice change to feel like you don't have enough because that's when God comes through in miraculous ways to supply and even oversupply. I've had that experience in my life over and over again. The great missionary Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary in China, had complete trust in God's faithfulness. In his journal, he wrote these words, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He knows very well that his children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. We do not expect he will send three million missionaries to China, but if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. Depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. 
Is there anything else that could point more clearly to Yeshua than this table of showbread? In John chapter 6, in the gospel, we read from verse 30 of that chapter. Yeshua says to them, or they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yeshua said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then in verse 41 and following, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And then verse 47 and following, Yeshua says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Now I take this to be symbolic. that We're not literally eating the flesh of Yeshua and drinking his blood. Just as Yeshua said, I am the vine and you are the branches. It's symbolic. It's a picture. But there is something real about coming into the presence of God and in a spiritual sense, feeding upon his presence, the bread of life. There is something extraordinary as the people of God gather together at the table of the Lord. In fact, in the kingdom of God, there will be Abraham and all the great patriarchs around the table with the saints of God throughout all the ages. And Yeshua himself will be at that table. You remember, he longed to eat that supper with his disciples again in the next age. And God desires to have that kind of fellowship with his children around the table, even now in a symbolic way, but one day in a very real way at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, if you wonder if Yeshua can supply all that you need, provide for all that you need for your nourishment and sustenance, let me just tell you the context in which Yeshua brought this message in John chapter 6. For he had just fed 5,000 men. And when you count the women and children, probably at least 15,000 he fed from one boy's little lunch. He can supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Messiah Yeshua. It is no accident that Yeshua was born in a town called Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. John chapter 12, verse 23 and following, Yeshua declares, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Yeshua is this grain of wheat that fell into the earth for three days. And Yeshua is that grain of wheat that rose from the earth to produce enough bread, enough food, both physical and spiritual, for the whole world to feed upon for eternity. In order to make bread edible, the dough must be baked in the fire, 
And Yeshua had to endure the fire of suffering of the Father's wrath upon that cross before he could be this bread for us. This bread on the table of presence, the table of showbread, was to be made of fine flour. This fine flour symbolizes the sinlessness of the Messiah. He is perfectly fine. There is no coarseness in him. In him there is no sin. Someone wrote about the perfect character of Yeshua saying that in him there is meekness without weakness, tenderness without feebleness, firmness without coarseness, love without sentimentality, holiness without sanctimoniousness, truth without error, enthusiasm without fanaticism, passion without prejudice, heavenly mindedness without forgetfulness, carefreeness without carelessness, service without servility, self-exaltation without egoism, judgment without harshness, seriousness without somberness, mercy without softness. Is there any finer human being than this? Before I conclude, I want to expand on one other thing that is alluded to in the text. And it's the way that God is a host who welcomes us into his presence, who invites us to his table, not because we're always that nice and always in a good relationship with him. I want you to understand that this table of his presence, this table of showbread, also reminds us that God loves the sinner, and he goes out of his way to bring the sinner into his presence. In ancient days, when two enemies decided to lay down their arms and be reconciled, they would make a covenant or peace pact between them by taking bread and putting salt on it and then eating it together. Even today, when two Arab villages have a falling out, they have a sulha or a table of eating where feuding enemies come together to be reconciled over a meal. Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat did this when they met each other for the first time. They broke bread together and ate a meal together and then made peace together. Back then, in the Bible, people who ate and drank together saw themselves bound to one another by friendship and mutual obligation. Rather than using knives and forks, small Pieces of bread were the primary means of conveying food from the bowl to your mouth. And eating in this way involved participants in a covenant-like friendship around that table. And they would all dip into the same bowl. It was a much more clear picture of what it means to be in fellowship and be reconciled one to another, to be in covenant. And we have a beautiful picture of the reconciliation of Simon Peter, to Yeshua after having denied the Lord three times. You would think that was enough. Three, t- three t- strikes and you're out. <laughs> and never to come into the presence of the Lord again. But after his resurrection, we find Yeshua and Peter eating bread and eating fish on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. John 21, 15 says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Yeshua said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yeshua said to him, Feed my lambs. And Peter was reconciled to the Lord again at that meal of bread and fish. Some of you in this room tonight may be standing outside the camp, even outside the the tabernacle, and you're estranged from God. You've turned your back on the Lord. Like Simon Peter, you've denied him. Well, I have good news for you tonight. The Lord has prepared prepared a table for you. He has prepared breakfast for you. He is saying to you, let's be reconciled. Come, let's eat together. And the Lord is here tonight to offer you the bread of life, to be your bread of reconciliation. And if you'll confess your sins tonight and recognize that he himself took your judgment and condemnation upon himself, you can enter God's dining room tonight. You can come to the table. Yeshua says in Revelation 3.20, I read it earlier, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he 
with me. He loves you. He loves me. He created us, put us on this planet that he might have a remnant people to fellowship with for eternity. Will you be at that table? Will you be at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Will you be in his very physical presence even forever? He's inviting all of us to that kind of relationship. Lord, I pray that this message would sink deep. Pray that the conviction of your Holy Spirit would not come across to us in our own way as condemnation. For you did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world. But I do pray, O oh God, that you would cause each and every one of us to come into your presence, having put our trust in the sacrifice on that bronze altar and having been washed at the laver by your word and by your spirit, born again, cleaned up, and ready to enter your home. May none of us leave this place not having received you as Lord and Savior and decided to walk with you and serve you all the rest of our lives. Change us, I pray, O oh God. May we be your holy priests. May we be your faithful servants. And may we go in your strength, nourished upon the bread of life. In Yeshua's name, amen. Worship team, lead us. Ushers, would you come now to distribute the bread and the, the wine? We're in the presence of the Lord. Are you glad you're in the presence of the Lord? Isn't he a good host?
We know from Jewish writings that on this table of showbread, there were also two vessels to pour out, one for the drink offering or the libation of wine, and there were goblets into which the wine was poured. So the table of showbread is the foundation for what we're doing this evening, as we have this bread, and it's pure, it's unleavened, symbolic of sinlessness. And we have the wine, symbolic of blood that was poured out. And they took the blood from the sacrifice on the burnt offering, of the burnt offering, and then poured out that wine as a, an offering to the Lord, that, or that blood as an offering to the Lord. And they sprinkled that blood upon the nation that they might be clean. Aren't you thankful for Yeshua who offered himself as that sacrifice? Aren't you thankful for his blood that has been sprinkled on us and made us clean. All of this thing called the tabernacle is pointing us to Yeshua. A progressive revelation from the Torah until the new covenant leading us to the one and only Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach Adonainu. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And Yeshua's body was broken on that cross, it was pierced. He took the scorching heat of the wrath of God, justified anger because of our sin. He took that unleavened bread, that bread that symbolized sinlessness, and he knew that that was his body. He didn't deserve to go to the cross. We deserve to go to the cross. And he went and 
allowed his body to be broken that we might be whole. Would you take that piece of bread in your hand and let's thank him right now. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't die as a victim, but as a volunteer. You went to the cross, not because of what you did wrong, but because of what we did wrong. Thank you for taking our place. And Lord, we take of this bread and we remember that you are the bread of life. And that if we put our faith and trust in you, we know that we will never lack. You will always supply our every need. We feed upon you our life, the bread of heaven. Amen. Let's eat together. That same night he took the cup. There were four cups that were that the people drank at that Seder meal at the Passover. I believe Yeshua took the blood or the cup of messianic redemption in his hand when he said these words, Bruchata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melchaulama, Bore Prihagafen. Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Because Yeshua's blood was shed, because he took the pain and the agony that comes with excruciating death, we get the gift of joy and celebration. For what he has done. The fruit of the vine, a symbol also of celebration. I don't think it would be sacrilegious to say, let's make a toast. Let's celebrate the Savior of the world, my Savior, your Savior. Let's celebrate. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you grateful tonight? Let's stand. Let's celebrate with a song. Let's go out with joy.